That is great, isn't it? It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, I've got a message. I've been in prayer this week, and, and uh, God has shared several things with me. Um, so I'm going to take all the parts and try to put them together. <laughs> but um, praise the Lord. I, I've been t- on this for, for a while now, talking about the presence of God and having awareness of the presence of God. That's one thing. And then another thing is, is, is last Sunday, I uh, kind of introduced a, uh, another uh, theme, if you want to call it that, uh, talking about the impossible made possible. Amen. You know, we look at circumstances in different situations and we see the impossible. However, God can move in the same, uh, in the same realm and all of a sudden the impossible becomes possible. Amen. So uh, I, I believe what, what is happening is God is preparing us for the next year coming in. Oh, we're getting close to the Christmas season and different things like that. Amen. It's always a time of the year that I uh, listen particularly close to the Lord because a lot of times he gives me my assignment, uh, what we're supposed to do in, in the following year. And it, the 30 some odd years I've been in ministry, this is what's happened, uh, 30, almost 32 years, right, in Key West, uh, something like that, Yeah, 30, coming up on 32 years um, in Key West, this is what he's done. Um, we live in, a, in, in, an, in an atmosphere, in a culture in Key West that might, some might call ungodly or whatever. Uh, but the fact is, is God has put us here for a reason. And I like to recognize that reason and the purpose that we're here and never stray from it. Um, you should never let outside influences, when I say outside influences, outside meaning the king, outside the kingdom of God, influence your life in any which way, shape, or form. Uh, we are who God has made us to be. He's called us with a, with a purpose. I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. But the title of my message is interesting because I wasn't planning on this, the, and I got the title. Uh, um, <laughs> I had the theme of what I wanted to talk about, and God gives me this title, kind of switches things around. But uh, I'm talking about this morning about victory upon the mountain. Amen. Victory upon the mountain. And I want to share some scriptures before with you. I probably haven't shared in a long time or uh, any time anyway, but God has been showing me some different things. How many know when I say the word mountain, we look in the Bible, there are several, several themes that talking about a mountain. Matter of fact, the one that co- comes to mind most readily is uh, uh, Mark eleven twenty three, where it says, you know, speak to the mountain and be thou removed. Yeah. And Jesus wasn't talking about a physical mountain like Mount Everest or the Rocky Mountains or anything else, uh, but he was talking about mountains of authority that were blocking and hindering the plans of God, were also referred to as mountains. Interesting, though, I noticed that when Jesus uh, went to teach, now we talk about the Sermon on the Mount. How many of you are familiar with the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew? Probably the most complete teaching of Jesus' doctrine and theology, the most complete in all the Bible. Jesus sat down in one sitting and basically laid out the entire belief. Did you know he sat down, and, and, and I'm familiar with Israel. I've been to Israel several times. Um, uh, my wife has family there. Uh, I have in-laws there, <laughs> same family. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but we've been there several times for family gatherings, for different things for family. And my brother-in-law and sister-in-law live right around the Sea of Galilee. What we know is in the Bible, the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus country. <laughs> so uh, I've, the, the, the perspective of what I can see when God says about a mountain, the perspective of that mountain, okay, I know what he's talking about. Because I went to the place that's called the uh, Mount of uh, Beatitudes, to where Jesus sat down and he gave us the Beatitudes, but it was actually a Sermon on the Mount. To see that in relation to where the village and where the people lived uh, is, is mind-boggling. Uh, so so you, you see, the, you see the, 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 the length of time. My point is this. People had to really work at getting to where Jesus was to hear what he had to say. I mean, if you walked, if you were on the shore uh, of the Sea of Galilee, uh, um, in that time, it was it was a, a Charism, Bethsaida, and, and Caesarea, right there. You could see the uh, where the villages were at uh, from the mountain. You had to climb up the mountain, uh, so to speak, to get to where Jesus was at. 
they didn't come in just a few, one here, when they had the time or it was convenient for them to get there. They dropped what they were doing to hear the word of the Lord spoken unto them. It was that real and that alive. So, but Jesus chose that spot. And that wasn't the only time Jesus ever went to the top of a mountain. He went to the top of a mountain. It seems like when he wanted to give us victory, he went to the mountaintop. And came down, even if he came down off the mountaintop like he did, uh, John the Baptist was beheaded, uh, uh, Jesus got the news, and he went to the mountaintop to be with the Father, to be able to speak and, and, and pray with the Father. When he came down, here's a sea of people that had walked completely around the Sea of Galilee to get to him. He came down from the mountain, and he began to preach, and all of a sudden they ran out of, they didn't have enough food, it was getting late, so the disciples said, let's just send them away. He said, no, no what, what do we have? He said, let's feed them. And that was when the, 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 the miracle happened of those fishes when Jesus came down off the mountain. If we go back into the Old Testament, we can find out where Moses uh, came off a mountain. He was a mountain 40 days, speaking with God in, 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 in thunder and lightning, and God talking to Moses and the whole thing, and comes down with the, with the commands and with a plan to, to a sea of people that were in idolatry. And this is with, where they were at. And, and, and Moses had to take now the, the glory from the... They, they made him cover his face with a veil because the glory of God was shining through and they couldn't stand to look at him, so he had to cover his face because he was in the presence of God. But he did it on a mountain. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk about a mountain this morning. We're going to take it from a little different angle. Many things that we have that we read in the Bible, many things that we read in the Bible uh, uh, are understood only from a position of relationship. The reason the Bible becomes such an anomaly, such a uh, misunderstood book a lot of times is because there are certain things that were there on purpose that God put in his word on purpose that you're only going to understand with a relationship from him. So the casual viewer, if you will, if I can use that language, the casual viewer, uh, can, uh, some things are not going to be understood. Because if you're just casually looking for information, there's some things in the scripture that's going to be missed. You're not going to be able to see those, uh, those things. But to have a relationship with God is paramount. Being in the presence of God is paramount to all the things that we're about to share uh, as far as understanding. So when we talk about the mountain, it, there's a lot in here. Uh, you know, um, I mean, we could go from one end to the other. Mountains had a lot of, lot of things to do in the mountains. So I was praying this week, and, and God showed me something. I'm not sure if I've, pray, if I've even taught on this for a while or a long time. Uh, but I want to talk about a Deborah this morning. This is interesting because where this takes place is exactly the area that I've been to several times. I know the, I know this, the groundwork. I know the, uh, the topography. I know everything. And basically what happens in, in the book of Judges in chapter 4, Deborah, by the way, is very unique. Uh, um, there's a couple of unique women I'm going to talk about this morning in this same story in the book of Judges. Do you realize Deborah is the only woman judge mentioned in the list of judges? She's the only woman. Not only is she a judge, but she's also a prophetess. So here God took the best that he had, both of two things, to guide the people of Israel at that time and put them both into a woman. I give the women all a chance to make a big amen right there. Hallelujah you got to understand the culture because this is almost unheard of for the culture of the day, but God chose. It's his choice. This is what God has chosen. Okay, This is before the day of Pentecost when the Spirit of God was poured out on all flesh. This was, this was during the culture of, of men run the country. Men were head of the household. Men, and, and, and the responsibility for faith and belief fell on the man. God put it that way, proposed that way. But here comes Deborah. And what was happening at this time, for 20 years, they were in bondage to the Canaanites. It seemed like each person of significance that died, okay, Israel would turn back to the gods of the world. Whatever empire conquered them, because basically they turned from God, which left them wide open to being conquered by another nation. When they were conquered, they used to pick up the gods of that nation. Well, this just happened to be the nation of the Canaanites, and the Canaanites, uh, they were worshiping their god, angered God. 
But what happens in the oppression, in the slavery, in the oppression of the Canaanites, they begin to cry out to God, and God set up another judge. It's amazing. Because there's, there's, there's a group, a list that go from, uh, uh, from end of Joshua's death, from the end of Joshua, all the way down to Samuel, that, uh, of these judges uh, to you know, help guide the people in the things of the Lord. They don't only just guide the people. They were, a judge would sit down and they would determine if you had a dispute with your neighbor, you went to the judge and a judge would decide. And this is what it was about. And to keep peace in the nation and to keep the unity in the nation, this is what they did. Deborah was a woman. Uh, she was married. She was a wife. Uh, she, she was a prophetess and she was a judge. But she sat under a particular date tree. Get this. There's three tribes uh, that were involved in this thing, three, three of the Israeli tribes, uh, uh, by Mount Tabor. This is where it all, all happens, what we're talking about this morning. The border, the border uh, Mount Tabor was a border of the tribe of Zebulon, Issachar, and Nephitali. Issachar is where my brother-in-law, his, his roots go back to Issachar and that particular tribe. But um, those three tribes... And Mount Tabor sat in the middle as a border, so if you get the picture. Now, I've been to Mount Tabor. Uh, Mount Tabor is also known, if you go ahead and Google it, you'll find out it's there today in Israel. Uh, it's about 1,800 feet high, both sea level. And it's famous for this. It's called the Mount, Mount of Transfiguration. And the Mount of Transfiguration being that Jesus, when he took his disciples, Peter, James, and John, three disciples, they sat down and there, was, uh, there appeared Elijah and Moses and so in front of Jesus. And they remember they wanted to build three tabernacles and so on and so forth, and they, they were impressed. It was supposed, a tradition puts it on Mount Tabor, um, but not necessarily. The Bible doesn't mention where it's at, but Mount Tabor is when to get the credit. If you go up there today, there's two churches. There's one, a Catholic church, and there's one Orthodox church up there uh, on the top of Mount Tabor. But this was the mountain. In, very interesting, because this is where the victory was, was won. This was the salvation in, in God's uh, sovereign plan. This mountain became the salvation of Israel at the time of Deborah. But Deborah, I started telling you about, she sat underneath a, a, a date tree, a date palm. Uh, I, I, I picked that up in the scriptures because I, I like dates. <laughs> and they come off a palm tree. But anyway, she would sit there and she would judge the people. She would, people would bring their, and those three tribes generally would be around that area and this is, would, would come to her sometimes miles away just to hear what she had to settle disputes or to hear what the Lord was, was saying would come through Deborah. So get this, the people came to her. They, she didn't go to them. The people came to Jesus at the Mount of Beatitudes. Jesus didn't necessarily go to them. Now, Jesus did go from village to village, but when he sat up, he sat in a place, he went into a synagogue, he taught, and the people came to where it was at. Is it possible that today we're missing some things because we're not going to where God expects us to be. Just a question. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe we could get more from that because there was a time that God expected me to go where it was happening. I remember when he first called me to the mission field. And uh, the first uh, mission uh, trip I ever took uh, from Key West, uh, just a new pastor in Key West, a new church in Key West. I planted this thing 30-some you know, years ago. But uh, we... we, we uh, got an opportunity, and the first country I went to was Jamaica. And on the way to Jamaica, and on the way on the plane, I was asking God, uh, why Jamaica? Matter of fact, a, a friend of mine, Gary uh, Adolphus, he was a minister up in, in Lakeland, Florida, and he had the contacts, and basically I was just tagging along. I just asked him, can I tag along? You know, I don't care what I do. I'll carry a suitcase. I don't care. I just, just tag along. But the Lord was pressing upon me to go to this place. Why? Because God showed me something in that place that I was never going to see in Key West. Though he called me here. But my concern was, what happens to the church when I'm gone for a week, 10 days, or whatever it is? What happens to the church? And God said, this is where the faith comes in. You have to trust me to be able to keep what you have at home. At that time, everything fell on me. I mean, I, everything. I mean, our ministry of health was weak at best, and everything fell on me. And if I'm gone, it falls on my wife. And uh, I said, well, you know, can she handle all this stuff? We, we did fine. But there were certain things and a certain perspective, because what I want to talk about this morning, this is about perspective. 
where is our perspective? Well, I said, now, I, I laid the groundwork kind of last week when I said, okay, you're coming into impossible situations. How do we see the possibility in the impossible? And I'm going to tell you this morning, it's a shift in your perspective. That's what I want to talk about. The answer is already there because God had the answer before the, even the problem rose. How many know that? How many know you didn't suffer any problem that God didn't know about beforehand? Amen? Amen? And I'll get into a little bit of that, too, if I get the time. Praise the Lord. Um, I didn't set my um, phone up here for time, so God, you give me, a, give me the flash. I didn't time myself. I, didn't, I forgot my phone this morning. So um, I was, is that okay? Okay, so if I run a little bit over, you'll forgive me? Okay, praise the Lord. All right. So anyway, I, did, I normally have my phone up here with a timer going and, and I, to see how much time I got left, but I'm going to let the guys back there. Um, I have my... Um, uh, producer and my director. Um, and what are you, Jeff? Charger makeup? I forget what you are. Anyway, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's like a production anymore. <laughs> anyway, come on, give me a break. I'm just an old time preacher. Praise the Lord. Anyway, so I, I look at this. The, the impossible, God is. I, I shared this with you last week. Let me, for the sake of repeating myself, I notice in the Bible, wherever God says, I'll be with you, fear not, I'll be with you, Joshua. Fear not, I'll be with you. Every place God says, fear not, I'll be with you, you can look at the situation, and I'll tell you right now, they're going to be confronted with an impossible situation. Because God wouldn't have to tell them, fear not, unless there's something to be afraid of. Uh, I'm going to be with you. Now you have a choice. Are you going to take the spirit of fear that's not from God or take God's word for it and trust in him Amen. at the time you need him the most? Now the choice is yours. God is also a God of believing in our free choice. I mean, we make a choice. Praise the Lord. Okay, so, this, so all right, let, let me get back on, on message. So let me talk about Deborah. So Deborah would sit there on the, at her date palm, probably eating her dates and enjoying those nice sweet um, date palms of Israel. And, and it, anyways, praise the Lord, I'll get back to the message. But she would sit there and judge. All of a sudden, the Lord came to her. Now, they were in bondage for 20 years. Under, remember that. 20 years, they were in bondage to the Canaanites. Most of the people were already worshiping their gods. But when, the, when, the, when we end up worshiping or end up giving in to Satan, how many know it doesn't add goodness to our life, but as misery? 20 years they put up with this misery, now they want to be set free. So they cry out to God, and the message comes to Deborah by God, by way of God, and she says, you tell Barak, that's the, that's the king, the, the king, well not king, but the leader of that time, Barak's nation, she says, you tell him, and this is the plan. So we pick this up in Judges chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, then Deborah said to Barak, up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered uh, uh, Sisera, Sisera was the, the, the commander under Jabin, who was the king over the, uh, the, the Canaanites. Uh, so, so he says, uh, uh, into your hand. This is the day. Now, after 20 years, the people have cried out. Now, this day, you have to move today. Well, you know, I got some things coming up. You know, I got to work. And, and you know, I got to do some things. No, 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 today is it? Well, you know, I, I, I could today, but you know, tomorrow looks a little bit better. I think the sun's going to come out. It's going to be a little bit nicer day tomorrow. Let's wait till tomorrow for a nice day. Don't look at me like that. Come on, church. We do the same thing. Well, you know, does it really mean to, did God really say today? I mean, come on, does he sit up there in heaven with a calendar? Come on, I mean, does, is it really? No, she says, get up now for this day is which the Lord has delivered these Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone out before you? She, that's a question. She says, has not the Lord? So Barak went down from, the mount, from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. What was he doing on the mountain in the first place? See, here's something that happened, was that he was commanded, he listened to Deborah. And he, interesting thing, I didn't put it in my notes, but you can look, on, look in, in, in the next verses down, to verse 8. Because what basically happens, Rat gives her a hard time. He says, you want me to take my 10,000 troops and go up on the mountain. He says, unless you go with me, I'm not going. So we have a man who's looking to be led by a woman. 
in a role that he should be doing, should have a confidence enough to listen to the voice of the Lord. So Deborah snaps back at him and says, okay, I will. I'll go with you to get you, in other words, I'm paraphrasing here, but to get your butt to move, I'll go with you. But do you really want me to go with you? Because God's going to give you a victory and it's going to be credited to me. So do you really want to be known as the leader of an army that was listened to a woman? Basically, that's what she said. In that day, that culture was absolutely... That was the, he says, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and that's what he did. The strategic place of the mountain was very strategic. God had to plan. They couldn't see it coming. The Israel's, Israelites could not see it coming, and the enemy certainly couldn't see it coming. But what was happening is they were rumbling and praying towards God, and here comes Sesera with all his 900 chariots made of iron. Now, 900 chariots was like a group of tanks today. And he's rumbling towards Mount Tabor. He's rumbling towards their villages, and he's about ready to put to squash this rebellion in a in a in a, sh- a shake. And that's all there is to it. And they only mentioned nine hundred chariots, but that wasn't the only thing. With those chariots, had to come uh, other uh, horses and men and troops and so on and so forth. The only guess, ten thousand. I'm guessing they were outnumbered. At ten thousand troops for the Israelis, I'm guessing they're outnumbered. Because generally, <laughs> they are always outnumbered. <laughs> I mean, that's a good guess. We don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't say. But that's a good guess. They're always outnumbered. Matter of fact, Gideon thought he had a pretty good force. Still outnumbered, but 32,000. And God reduced him down to 300. So God isn't just in multiplication. He's also in redu- reduction. Amen? Why? Because basically... He says, fear not, for I'll be with you, Gideon. (laughs) Here it comes. Because now we had an impossible situation with 32,000 troops. Now we got a more impossible situation with only 300 troops. That's about 450 to 1, Gideon was outnumbered. (laughs) And God delivered Israel, did he or did he not? So you can't look at circumstances and gauge from circumstances when circumstances look impossible God can wipe out those impossibilities for possibilities. Amen? All right, praise the Lord. So so here we go, we're ready. Amen. So she says to him, she says, uh, all right, I'll go ahead. She says, and so he went up to Mount Tabor. This is kind of an interesting mountain. I mean, uh, when I go to my brother-in-law's place, he can almost see this from his backyard. I mean, it, this, it's, a, it's a landmark. I know once I see Mount Tabor, where I leave uh, Ben Gurion Airport out of Tel Aviv, and I see Mount Tabor, yeah, we're almost there. Hallelujah. That's after 12 hours of flying, <laughs> whatever layover we had in Europe, and then uh, on, on, and on a long trip. I said, yeah, Mount Tabor is a good site for me uh, because that means we're about to get something to eat. Anyway, praise the Lord. But uh, So Mount Tabor sits there. What happened is God positioned, and this is what we have to understand about the mountain. It's a positioning and a perspective. Climbers say this, mountain climbers say this, they say, they say the best view uh, comes from the toughest climb. In other words, there was an effort put forth. To move 10,000 men on this mountain, it's a good-sized mountain, but it's steep. It's, it's, when you look at it, it just looks like a big mountain, a knoll. Okay, the top is kind of flat. Oh, you got a picture? Oh, there you go. That's exactly. Was that one of my pictures? I, yeah, there it is. And you see a little building on the top. If you look in the, in, in the, on the live stream, there it is. Right there is the church. And this is Mount Tabor. Amen? Wow. Pretty cool. See that? The wonders of technology. I'm talking about it. They put it up on the screen, and so basically you can see it. Mount Tabor. 10,000 troops, if you have any kind of imagine, 10,000 troops. In it. Now, what the king is going to do there's the Kishon River that runs there, and in my Bible it calls it a wadi, the wadi of Kishon. And the wadi means, what a wadi means is means it's a river that dries up and it's only for, filled seasonally. So there's a time of the year when there's no, uh, the, remember the rock I had from, I talked about David, and I had the rock from uh, the, the uh, brook of Allah. Well, the brook of Allah is a wadi. I didn't have to wade out in any water, I just had to pick it up. It was in the rainy season that comes water. 
But what happens is, when I said it was this time, this was the time that God was about to do something that was off the hook, that was really um, uh, unprecedented for the day. <clears throat> As the Canaanite troops are moving in, and sure of battle, we put down rebellions before, we've got this, we've got our chariots, uh, uh, maybe even Egyptian made, who knows, but they had our chariots, and there's nobody on foot. They were, we have a ragtag, 10,000 man troop, we have uh, the worst weaponry you can imagine, and odds built up against them, uh, mounting by the hour. All of a sudden, what happens is God says to Deborah, just have those troops on that mountain. That's all I need to get them on the mountain and get them on the mountain quick. Get them up there now. This is the day. This is the day it's all going to happen. Do not rejoice. As they're on the mountain, what God has done, he brings in a cloud and a deluge of rain. And he floods the valley. The Kishon Wadi is now the Kishon River with overflowing banks. One thing happens when you have chariots in rain. Now, the only place that he could use those chariots was not on the mountain. He couldn't chase people up the mountain with a chariot. But he could surround them to the, at the base and cut off their supply line and starve them out. It was probably his plan. But instead, so he's using that dry riverbed at Wadi, makes a perfect road when you don't have a whole lot of roads. And he used to bring those chariots up that river. God had him planned. Here come the chariots. I can hear the noise of the wheels. I can hear the troops, the rattling of the harnesses on the horses. And here they come. Here they come, and we've got nothing. Now they are blocking us from our food supply, and they have cut us off. This looks like an impossible situation as Brock is looking over the battlegrounds. What do I do? Where do I send my troops? If I send any troops down there now, they're going to be mincemeat. They're going to be done. Deborah's saying, I can just hear her saying, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Once you're positioned where God has you positioned, the next thing to do is wait because the next move is going to be God's. If you are positioned where he has placed you, the next move is God is going to do something so unprecedented that you haven't even imagined it because he can do that, can he? And what he did, he brought, now comes the cloud cover, now comes the deluge, and poured down rain in such a way that the Kishon Wadi became the Kishon River overflowing banks, and the chariots were stuck, the ones that didn't get swept away with the floods and the flash floods that were coming down. God, with one single swoosh of a flash flood, wiped out the Canaanite army to where it was now, just Cesera was on foot, running from his chariot, booking it out of there as quick as he could. So the one commander who was in charge of everything, looking to wipe out all the Israeli oppression and rebellion with one swoop of his, of his 900 chariots, is now running for his life because now at the sight of that deluge of rain come, comes uh, 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 Barak's troops, and he's on a chase. What does Sisera do in a situation like that? He leaves his chariots. They're stuck in the mud. He can't do it. So he just runs and he has it on foot. He books it across. And he goes to a tent which he thought was an ally because the woman's husband had made a pact with the king, King Jabin, which was the king over the Canaanites. And what happens is his wife is home, but he's not home. So he goes to her tent and he said, can you hide me out? And she's so sure. Come on in. Come on in. That should be a sign right there because here's the second woman that's going to, about to do something in this story. You women should be liking this sermon. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And the husband's long gone. He doesn't, he's not around. But say, so oh, yeah, come on in. Come on. And he says, can I hide in your tent? And if anybody comes looking for me, tell them I'm not here. Oh, sure, sure. And she says, could you get me a glass of water? She says, oh, sure, sure. Lay over here. She says, why don't you just lay down? And I'll, I'll get you. And she brings him over, not water, but a cup of milk. Now, what happens when you're tired? You sit down with a glass of milk. Oh, you're going to relax. Oh, it's time to go to sleep. So basically what happened was, Cesare lays down. She says, oh, no, no. She says, lay on your side over here. She's positioning this guy now to go to sleep. She says, here, let me cover you with a blanket. You're safe here. Oh, you're relaxing here. Before you know it, in seconds, he's snoring away. He's just, he's out. 
She goes outside, she gets a tent peg with a hammer. Careful. When a woman invites you in a house and it's not your wife. I just threw that in there. I don't know. But anyway, this woman's name was Jael. She's a hero in Israel to this day. And what she did, she picked up a tent peg, and while he was sleeping, the Bible says she gently went over and put the tent peg against his temple, because he's laying like this, against his temple. And she, Now, this had to be a strong woman. The Bible's very descriptive at this point. She took this tent stake, which so I'm, I'm saying is anywhere about this length, uh, I'm guessing, but probably steel or metal, you know, iron, you know, iron age. But anyway, put that against this temple and drove it clear through his temple out the other side, and the Bible says, pinned him to the ground. Now, just that crime scene alone, if you were looking at that, you would say that was premeditated and that was determined. And there was, there was a driving of that stake through a determination. I brought that point up descriptively for this because this is what we need to do with the enemy yes, who's trying to make himself comfortable in your home. That's the same enemy that drove the nails into your Savior. That's the same thought process. It's the same enemy. Amen. So what do we do? Some driving of our own. Yes, Done. So J. Allen, she comes out, and by that time, here comes old Brack. He's chasing down Sisera, and he says, so she goes out and meets him. She says, come on in here. He's in here. He's in here. So he goes over to her, and he looks in, and what he sees, he sees, he sees this great big massive warrior, this Canaanite warrior, with a spike through his temple laying on the ground dead. I had to bring that picture because I want to show you something because it's sometimes if we look back, we will understand more than what we see. Do you remember this statement? Numbers chapter 14 and verse 9. Joshua and Caleb were one of the two of the 12 spies that were sent out. You know the story. And that Moses was sending out the spies to view over this land. The land that he was looking at was the land of the Canaanites. So Sassero is one of these giants that they were talking about. One of these giants that they saw they didn't like, or a descendant of these giants that they didn't like, because this was years later. So here's your giant now pinned to the ground with a stake by a woman. That had to be a disgrace to the Canaanites for years to come. He was taken out. Our strongest, mightiest warrior was taken out by a woman. Well, the Philistines had their strongest, mighty one taken out by a boy. Teenager. Throwing rocks. (laughs) <laughs> Why? God likes to take and situate us in impossible situations only to come in with a possibility that it just blows our minds. Amen. But he says this, and, and this is what it said in Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. And Joshua and Caleb are trying to steal the people because do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. Remember, they said all these lands are giants, man, and we look like grasshoppers before these people. These are the same people he's talking about, or at least the descendants of these same people. There's nothing big about them. J.L. didn't look at giants. She just looked at oppression of Israel. Clink, that was it. Deborah didn't look at giants. She said, no, let's take the high ground in this particular place. Let's position ourselves where the Lord has talked about positioning ourselves and let him do the work. Did God do all the heavy lifting in that battle? And they come down and reap the benefits and reap the the, the joy and begin to take. And pursue. This is what what Israel's good at, pursuing that. Once the enemy is overtaken by God, they don't stop until every last one is caught. Amen. Amen. The IDF fights like that today. But the fact is, is we know we're going to run them down. We're not taking prisoners today. So here comes Barak up outside, and he's looking, and and, and Jael is saying, come on in here, come on in here. This is the guy you're looking for. And she was a hero. Amen? The point of the story is he was in the position, or, or God positioned him. Another point of the story is fear coming on the spies They looked at these same people, even with the massive numbers that they had, even standing with Joshua through battles 
under command of Moses. They could not see the victory. All they could see is something that looked bigger than them. Are you here? Something that looked bigger than them. And what happens is how many things do we dismiss that could be God trying to bless us simply because we're afraid? How many things? Are, are we're afraid of this, or this isn't going to work. Uh, I've talked to experts. I read all kinds of stuff on, on the Internet. Uh, this, this is not going to end well, and so on and so forth, when it may be the very thing that God wants you to do. When I first started the church in Key West some 30, 30, almost 32 years ago, do you know how many people told me I could not do what I'm doing right now? I'm not talking about the people in the world. I'm talking about minister friends of mine. Says you, 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 Pastor, where? Oh my goodness! I mean, oh, I'll, I'll pray for you. And and they look at you with that sympathetic nod, you know. Mm. Uh, you know, praise the Lord, Key West. Mm. You know what Key West has been for us? One of the blessed places I've ever lived. Amen. Not what the town has provided. <laughs> it, it, they provide nothing really. It's what God has provided. But we've seen more miracles, and I've been around the world, preached on five different continents around the world, and let me tell you something, the majority of miracles I've seen have happened right in Key West, and it's happened to us. Yes, sir. In a small little church with an international vision that God has called, that, we, that, that other people seem to say this is impossible. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. He said, only don't rebel against this, for they, this is a statement that Joshua makes, for they are our bread. Their protection, uh, and their protection has departed them. Don't be afraid. They're our bread. And he makes this statement, they're our bread. What does that mean? That means when we move from this wilderness section where God is providing everything, he brings us into the promise. In the promise, we have a supernatural protection, but we also can provide not only for ourselves, but for other people. We have, we have now the opportunity of provision. See, in the wilderness, they had manna fell down all day. day. But when Joshua crossed that Jordan, he took the Ark of the Covenant, but the manna stopped. The manna stopped the day they crossed over. The day they crossed over is the day they started plowing ground. And they started looking for food, either buying it from the locals that are there or started planting it. Isn't it amazing today as Christians that we expect a 100-acre harvest when we don't want to plant 10. I don't have to talk to farmers in here, but I mean, I, I, used, to be, I used to be one. And I'll tell you right now, you're not going to get a 100-acre harvest when you're only going to, willing to plant 10. Okay, praise the Lord. That went over good. Amen. But can you imagine that this is what out of the 10 out of the 12 spies saw the people, the same people, with the same type of commanders, with the same kind of view, that a woman just drove a stake through his temple. And another woman heard from God and instructed the entire army of Israel onto one mountain. It looks like suicide because now they're all in one place and all you have to do is close off the bottom of that mountain and they're going to starve because they can't get back home and get, get food or supplies. So it looks like an impossible situation, but it was God setting them up to pull the trigger. Amazing. I love these old stories because they have so much truth in them today. Amen. Amen. Understand something. I put this in my notes just to, as a reminder for all of us on where we are. Do you know that there's something called the orig original commission? It's the original intent of God for mankind's creation to begin with. How many remember the story of creation? He created Adam and Eve. So I'm going to go back and, and remind you because in God's mind, this has not changed. It did not change because of Adam's sin. It did not change over the years. This is still God's idea and his vision, if I can put it that way, or his dream, some people say, but of what mankind should be and how we should walk. How many would like to see God's perspective this morning on how we're supposed, what we're supposed to look like? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen? Well, we already got the gender thing switched around. It doesn't matter, man or woman. God poured out his spirit in all flesh. So let's get over that, amen. Uh, but let's, let's look at what he says in Genesis chapter 1. He says, then God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve, and said to them, not him, them. Do you see that? Yeah. Did they put it up? In, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. So God blessed them and said to them, Genesis 1, 28, 
It says, be fruitful and multiply. How many can do that? How many have babies? We've got babies right in the sanctuary, so we know that's working. Right? Praise the Lord. Be fruitful and multiply. That's also a God-given plan. Yes, sir. Okay, I'll leave it. I'm about to get myself in trouble. I'll just leave it right there. How, praise the Lord. He says, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, here's the things we reach over, and it says, and have dominion. Two things, subdue and have dominion. You know subdue is a military term. Yes. At the creation of Adam and Eve, the world outside was full of darkness and a mess. Well, who, re who resided here before Adam and Eve? The devil. The fallen angels from heaven, this is where they were. So God takes a, a, a section, we don't know how big, but a section of, of property land, and he protects it, and he puts his, 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 his man and his woman right there in that protective land called the Garden of Eden. And God's protection from this world was out here. Most theologians, and I also believe, that that was not the final picture that we're supposed to see, but that was only the start. And that Garden of Eden was supposed to grow around the world until everything was subdued around it that did not line up with God. Are you, are you following me? Yes. No, it's subdue. You can use the word conquer, or you can word, you know, press back, or however you want to say it, but subdue. In other words, it's un, it's, it's, it's with, we're, we're, we're taking it back yes, type of thing. This is ours. This is our. This is your creative being is what God is looks at every mankind, every man, woman, born to the womb of a woman, everybody on planet Earth. This is what God sees in you. He sees somebody that can subdue if they'll just follow my word. Yes, now, Adam sins. He gets kicked out of the garden because God had to protect him from the other tree of life because he could live forever in a sinful state, and that wasn't about to happen. But God still gave this designed to us the original commission. He didn't change his mind. He didn't regress. We're still having kids, so there's proof right there. Okay, so it's still happening. The population here, they're still growing. It's still, but the subdued part is what's waning. Because in subduing, we've a lot like Israel. We want to take upon the next God of whatever government tells us to. That's what it was. The Canaanite had their God say, okay, we rule over you now. You will worship our God, and this Hebrew God of yours is no, no more. So the, the oppression without the Hebrew God, the people got cried out to God, and God raised up a word that made them subduers again to subdue the planet that they were being pushed off of. Yes, sir. Help me by this morning. Yes. May I remind you what happened on the mountain? May I remind you also at the beginning of this message, I said you, it, to get to the top of the mountain takes work, effort. Now, not that our works and effort brought the miracle. No, no, no. They just had to, it's, sometimes it's work and effort to be positioned where God wants to position us so we can be aligned, so he can empower us with supernatural empowerment to subdue. But we are created to subdue. At the end of the day, we're subduers. Amen? Amen? Now, some of you are getting ready. You're just going to subdue lunch. But, okay, if it's on the planet, you're still a subduer. Go ahead and chow down. Praise the Lord. Isn't it amazing? It's like God trains us and equips us for war. Then he arranges a conflict. <laughs> Does God really do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because the impossibilities you're looking at right now of the conflict. I had people come down over the years. They talk about Key West sometimes, but I had people come down, ministers come down, and, and usually they're here for a little while, and then they go someplace else. Some of them, a few of them in the past have come to me and says, how do you do it down here? I've had, I've had about three or four of them come to me and say, how do you do it? I said, do what? How do you, how do you have church here? You've got a daycare going, you have church going, you have ministry going. And, and you fly around the world. How, how do you do this? In other words, they look at this, and it doesn't look like enough to, per, uh, to, to push forward what we do. In other words, what I look like, I look like an impossibility looking for a place to happen. <laughs> and I say, I tell them honestly, I can't answer your question. Because it, if, if, if I had a formula, I could give you a formula, but it probably wouldn't work for you. 
I know what I do. I could share what I do. But I, again, it probably isn't going to work for you because it isn't in what I can do. I'm sure Barack had the troops, and they were formidable guys. I'm sure they were big, strong, and they were all healthy. Uh, no. But until they were in the position that God had them in, God couldn't deal with the enemy because they were too much in the line of fire. Maybe God can't deal with your enemies because you're in the line of fire. Get your fat head out of the way so you can pull the trigger. Maybe it isn't God at all. Maybe it's us getting in the way. Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes, it's getting in the position where God has places to be and stepping out of the way and let him do it. Sometimes. But there's other times where he says, no. He says, you pick up the tent peg and you pick up the hammer and drive some things home that are in your house that don't belong there. J.L. had a visitor that didn't belong in her house because her heart was with Israel. Her husband was not. His husband was, he's a meathead. He was with the Canaanites and with King Jabin. But it didn't matter. Her heart was for the Lord and for Israel. So you, who, so Lord, I can just hear the Lord say, pick up the tent peg and drive it through the skull, that demon, and free your whole household and the land around you. Amen. Be done with it. Well, this just took a turn I didn't expect. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> I mean, you got the graphics. Well, praise the Lord. Maybe something's wrong we do because we are created. But God will see to it that we have the opportunity. He arranges us to be subduers, and then he arranges the conflict. Are you here? <laughs> he hasn't done that in history? Hmm. Remember that conversation that Satan had with God before Job, in the book of Job? And God brought the attention to the devil, says, have you recognized my servant Job, who's righteous in all the land? He says, if I touch him, he'll curse you. No, he won't. This is the conversation. Remember the conversation? Yes. What did he do? He set up Job to get back what he lost. And he set up Job against the devil, but God set him up. So when Satan comes in, then God put the limitations on the devil and says, you can do everything, but you can't touch his life. If he doesn't curse me, you can't touch his life. You can touch everything around him, but you can't touch him. Hmm. Hmm. That was a conflict God set up. <laughs> Why? Because he knows the outcome before it happens. He knows the end from the beginning, and he knows the heart of a man who will stand by him. Man, I don't know where that one came from, but I threw that one in there too. Praise the Lord. Are we getting anything else? Yes, I'm going to close with this. Amen? I was praying, and I don't know why God likes to wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's the magic hour for whatever he wants to tell me sometimes. Maybe sometimes, sometimes I'm like you. I get too busy with my brain, and I have to wait till I finally shut down. But I don't know. 3 o'clock in the morning is the hour for me, and all of a sudden I wake up, and then all of a sudden God will put something. Well, he did that this week. And he dropped this scripture in me. Well, he dropped the word in me. I looked up the scripture later when I get the sleep out of my eyes and could finally concentrate on my computer. But he showed me James chapter 5, verse 16, just the second part of that verse. It says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. How many know that scripture? Have you ever broke it down? Does anybody here in the church, beside the ones that listened to me say this before, uh, did, no, ever look up the word avails? It's kind of, we don't use that kind of language today, you know. Um, we, my wife and I, we avail in town in our house. We avail. That doesn't work. I looked it up because a lot of times we get these words translated from the Greek, and this is in particular New Testament Greek into the English, and I looked up the word avail. How many here are righteous people and have a fervent prayer? Raise your hand if you figure you're a righteous person and you have a prayer. Okay. The rest of you will have a salvation call at the end of this. We'll give you an altar call. We'll get you all saved. Because that's what makes you righteous. Nothing that you're going to do is going to make you righteous. <laughs> but Jesus himself will make you righteous. Praise the Lord. So if I am righteous and I acknowledge that righteousness of Christ in my life, then all I have to do is put the fervency with prayer. That means faithfulness. That means complete. That means, that means explicit. That means bringing true. That means not giving up. That means you can turn. That's fervent, man. I'm into this thing. And my prayer, I believe, as soon as I say the words, it's going to make a difference. Uh, where do you get that? Well, God said I can. 
He said, speak to the mountain. That's words coming forth and changes the, the dynamics of things. God speaks and words, worlds come into existence. That's using words. That changes things. I guess my prayers are words. I guess my prayers can change things because it says right here that prayers of a fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Much means just what it means, much. It means a lot. I looked that up. But avail, here's what we get, we lose the religious content when we say it in religious terms. Well, you know, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So what does it mean? Well, I looked it up in the Greek. That word that we have in English word is called avail. In the Greek, this is what it actually means, to have or exercise force. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Look it up. It's, I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance Dictionary. You can look it up on your own and share those things. To be able. It also means might, to prevail, to prevail. When I avail, I prevail. Yeah. And when I pray according to the scriptures, I don't just avail, I prevail. Yeah. And I am speaking forth the words, not that uh, my words are Kevin Kerr, but what God has placed in me through his word that I speak with faith. And now I have the force that is going through yeah. to drive the tent peg where it needs to be driven. Yeah. Thank you, I feel better. Hallelujah. Amen, it also means to be of strength and to be whole. God. I'll go over the list again. To have or exercise force, be able, might, to prevail, be of strength, and to be whole. That one word translated from the Greek that we translate into English as avail, that's what it means. So now when you claim the righteousness of Christ, and you fervently, I'm not talking about sleepily, I'm not talking about lazily, I'm not talking about, oops, I forgot that. I'm talking about the fervent prayer. Now, when you speak the fervent prayer out of your mouth, which will be a prayer according to the scripture, guess what? It's, things are going to change and are going to happen. One more, I'm going to say this because this is the key to what I just said, and I'm going to let you go. One more. Psalm 67, verse 1 says, God be merciful unto us, bless us, cause his face to shine upon us. That means, uh, speaks God's favor. Uh, they're praying uh, in, in this psalm. In verse 2, it says, it says, let your way be known on the earth, your salvation among the nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let the people praise you. Oh, then let the nations gl glad sing for joy, and you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on the earth. Let your people, verse 5, let your people praise you, O God, let all the people praise you. Verse 6 is where it changes. Then, they put the word then in there. After I said all this, God be merciful, God bless us, God let the, uh, all the nations among us. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God Amen. shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Yes. Amen. What happened? What just happened in that psalm? It went from a prayer, a supplication, and it shifted to a declaration of what God is about to do. Now we start speaking forth the will of God. We got the prayer down, but now it comes to the declaration. Let's start decreeing what God is saying. Yes, and not only that, don't bless me, bless me, God, bless us for it no more. He's saying no, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. That's reverential fear. All the nations of the world will respect him right now in the name of Jesus. So it doesn't, our prayer should not just be about us and affecting us, but it should affect all the ones around us, including other nations. Now there you go. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where it says, subdue. Now we got the meaning of subdue. Now we really know what God means. He, he really means what he says, subdue. All right. How many are polishing up their tent pegs? <laughs> I, I didn't even put jail on my notes, but I just know the story. But boy, that seems to drive, uh, no pun intended, yeah, pun intended, drive home. <laughs> it really drives home the point. <laughs> How many got blessed this morning? Praise the Lord. 